My name is Don Dixon. I want to welcome you to another edition of our Structure Fishing Workshop. Let me insert this right here before I tell you the end of the story. When fish move in a lake, they all move at the exact same time. We have verified that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, just he and I, fishing in different areas of the lake. You could set your watch by it. When the fish move in a lake, they all move at exactly the same time. Now, it's important that I mention this right here. Now, don't think for one minute that all the fish in the lake got hungry at the same time impossible. See, fish don't move because they're hungry. Fish move because it, they are triggered to this activity period by a change in the light condition. The light in the upper spectrum that we can't see, Buck doesn't know what it is, but there's a light condition that takes place that triggers this movement. Now, obviously, we're fishing a lake. The light condition is the same all, all around the lake. So when the fish become active and move, they move all around the lake. So, because we had such a great movement up at Willow Bay Bar, I was expecting Tommy would have loaded up too at about the same time. And we kind of always would mark it, you know, at 4.30 the fish came, you know. So we get down there and when we get down to the meetup place, Tommy and his partner have already loaded their boat. They're sitting in the truck waiting on us. First question, man, how did it go? And Tommy said, well, this is something you haven't heard me say maybe one time in all the time we've been together. He said, but we didn't catch a fish. Ooh, what? He said, you heard me. We didn't catch a fish all day. He said, we worked some of the best looking structure you could ever shake a stick at. We didn't catch one little stinker. I said, oh, man. So then, of course, he asked, well, how did you guys do? I said, oh, man. The fish moved about 430, and they stayed up on the crown of this bar for about 40 minutes. We caught about 25 fish, smallmouth, nice fish, adults. We had, we had a ball, but we had only caught three fish prior to that. But when the fish moved, they moved on this number one structure that I had picked out in the, in the early morning. And they stayed for 40 minutes. But brother, the watercolor was beautiful. It was like fishing in a, in a lowland reservoir somewhere. Watercolor was great. And as we went and had dinner and reflected on that, the difference between the two results was so great that it's something that neither one of us ever forgot. Now, I want you to think about this now. Here's a guy who clearly one of the top five fishermen in the country. The reason most people never heard of him is because I always was doing all the talking. But we have the same knowledge, we had the same skill set in presentation of lures. We were fishing the same reservoir. We were fishing under the same weather condition. Everything was the same. And yet, Tony T and I caught about 30 fish. Tommy and his partner didn't catch one fish. And with Tommy not catching one fish, I mean, trust me, that's a scoop. You know, we fished hard together, pretty near every day for 15 years. He never didn't catch fish. But that day, zero fish. So here's what I want you to take away from this. What was the only difference? Same lake, same weather, same skill set, same knowledge. Everything was the same except watercolor. Where he was fishing four or five miles up from the dam, those fish never reached a, a, a depth where he could make contact. On the other hand, where I was fishing with a good watercolor, those fish moved all the way up onto the crown of that bar. Only difference, watercolor. So if my boat catches 30 and his boat catches nothing, I mean, that was so unmistakably different 
that neither one of us ever forgot it. And let me tell you one more thing. We've already told the story 17 times, but again, when you talk about a specific experience that will never ever let you forget the importance of watercolor, let's go back to the Muskie tournament. Let's go there. We're going to revisit one more time. We saw an 18 foot weed line in the lower end of that reservoir. We started heading for the headwaters as fast as we could get up there with our little 10 horse engine. While everybody was laughing at us. And two days later, we had caught on wire line downstairs, four muskies over 20 pounds, one almost 30, one everything. And think about this now. 250 of the so-called best muskie hunters in the country got totally skunked. Zero fish. 250 guys? Think about it. How is that even possible? Do you think there'd be one straggler, two stragglers? You got, somebody got to catch something just by dumb luck. But no. Reason why that cold front come through the, the night before this tournament started, a cold front come through and killed that fishing in that lake for two days. And it was so severe, because we've talked about this now just a couple of weeks ago, front were so severe. I'm betting those muskies down in the dam area must have dropped 75, 80, maybe 90 feet of water. They were untouchable, like the movie. They were like Elliot Ness, untouchable. You're fishing down in the dam area, the weather has sent them to China. You're dead in the water. You got no chance. Now, what did we do? We kept going north until we got into some better watercolor. And sure enough, we got into better watercolor and we've caught those fish deep. But they at least came into range for us with our wire line. They came into a range where we could catch them. And since we knew how to map and interpret a structure, we were fishing the right spot. So, and the fish really never moved, but a few fish over the course of two days stuck their head up. When they stuck their head up, we caught them because we were being precise. But when people ask me, what was the key to winning that tournament? Was it your ability to map and interpret deep structure? Was it your ability to recognize a sharper break? Was it the structure? Was it the lure that you were using? What was the number one reason you were able to catch four fish when 250 so-called great muskie hunters couldn't catch one fish? Difference was watercolor. I take those two experiences and I say you cannot deny the obvious. At the muskie tournament, we're all fishing the same lake fishing for the same species. We're all fishing under the same weather, same weather condition. What was the only thing we did different? Well, we actually did two things different. We fished deep. <laughs> but what we did different was we found some good watercolor up Finley Creek. That's the difference. So I can't explain in any more detail how important Buck's statement is when he says, choose your watercolor wisely if you have a choice. And in most all cases, we'll have some sort of a choice. If I'm living in an area of a bunch of natural lakes, I'm going to find one that's stream fed. I'd rather fish yellow green than fish clear. You always can find some. If you have natural lakes and you got reservoirs and one of your reservoirs is red sandy or white sandy and your natural lakes are clear, there's no choice. I mean, you're going to go fish that reservoir. Choose your watercolor wisely. Now, with all that being said, sun came out. With all that being said, I'm going to give you a fail safe. If you don't have enough experience to look at the water and define it as far as its color, I'm going to tell you how you can uh, automatically know if you got good watercolor or you don't. And again, I don't want to break it down to the all of the real details of it all so that you're going to end up getting a double doctorate degree in water, water coloration. That's not why we're doing this. I want you to be able to tell whether you got tough fishing or, or, or decent fishing. I want you to be able to tell because what 
our studies are all about is how can we simplify and break things down to guidelines so we know what we're looking at even though if we don't have all of the details we have enough to make a decision it's going to be determining whether you and I catch fish or whether we don't so with that being said here's your first checkpoint how deep are the weeds growing if they're growing to eight feet ten feet you have a dark yellow green automatic you don't have to look in and, and say oh that's a dark yellow green no if your weeds are growing eight ten feet it's a dark yellow green so now you know now if the weeds are growing between 12 and 14 that would be what we call just a yellow green not as good as a dark yellow green keep in mind the clearer the water the deeper the weed growth and the tougher the fishing now and then let's go further if you go to a, a weed line that's between 15 and 20 that's clear if your weeds are growing you go out and you've got massive weeds and where that wall ends here's your wall of weeds boom and the depth is 17 feet you got clear water if the depth of that wall of weeds is 20 feet in your clear natural lake find a new lake <laughs> that's my suggestion to you we already explained your yellow greens and your variances of the yellow green will be found in stream fed natural lakes in spring fed natural lakes you're gonna have clear water but you can determine it for sure by the depth of the weed growth. The deeper it is, the tougher the fish, and that simple. And the clearer the water, because it takes sunlight to grow weeds. Now, how about a reservoir? Well, like Palm de Terre. We had 18 foot weeds down at the dam. That's unusual. Clear, clear as a bell. Up where we caught our musket, there was no 18 foot weed line, and there was good water color. That was the difference. So keep in mind now, in a reservoir, you can have clear water in a dam area, but better water color halfway up the reservoir, or maybe in one of the arms, uh, the big side secondary rivers that are coming in, creating better water color. Uh, so you can have clear in one spot, but good water color in another. In most all cases, our better water color in a reservoir is going to be up towards the headwaters. The only thing you have to be concerned about is when you're moving up the reservoir to find better water color. I never want to go past where I don't have at least 20 feet in the channel. I got to have some deep water. So keep in mind, in most all cases, we're moving towards the headwaters to find better water color. Now, in the case of lowland reservoirs and some flatland reservoirs that are when you, when you go out into the lake, it looks like a white sandy or a red sandy. Normally, that's the color all throughout the lake. Now, in the case of Highland Reservoir, like the story I told today, it's built in rocky, mountainous terrain. It's going to be steep, clear, deep, rocky bottom, no weeds. The key, moving towards the headwaters, make all the difference in the world. All right. All that being said, I hope that we're clear. Oh, wait a minute. I do want to tell you one more thing. Here's another part of that fail safe as you're trying to figure out what your water color is until you get really experienced. I want you to take. Now, I'm assuming you got some spoon plugs. I hope you got either a white red head. If you have a white spoon plug, some bright colored spoon plug. I like to use white. I put it over the side of the boat and I watch that lure disappear. And if it disappears in six inches, ooh, good water color, white sandy. Six inches disappears. Six, eight inches, it's gone. You can't see it anymore. Ooh, good water color. If it drops down about two feet before you lose sight of it, you're still okay. You're in the yellow green. You're still all right go fishing but if you drop that weight lure down there and you see it hit the bottom and you're in 20 feet of water time to find a new lake so a lot of common sense goes into this too I don't care if you call me and say I, I'm pretty sure it was a light yellow green or <laughs> now, if you can still see the lure when it's 15 feet deep you need to find another lake what we like to say have happen is to see that lure disappear in just six or eight inches or 10 or 12 inches. We know we got a great water color.
and we can expect the fish to move within range so we can catch them. Keep in mind, the cloudier the water, the shallower the fish will move. Same lake. They're moving all at the same time, but some are only moving to here down near the dam and up where we're fishing, they're moving up to here. And the shallower they move, the warmer the water, the warmer the water, the faster they swim, the more they eat, the more active they become, the longer they stay, and the easier they are to catch. Bottom line, watercolor. As Buck Perry says, it's the most important thing you can do to ensure your success. Choose your watercolor wisely. So the next time we get together, we're going to start talking about lake types, the different types of lakes and reservoirs that exist. And there's quite a few, but there's not so many that we can't study it and come to some conclusions. There are guidelines and keys to air fish in every different type of lake or reservoir. And that's the study we're going to get into next. And I think it's important because I want to know as much as I can possibly know about a fishing situation before I put my boat in. Remember we talked about it, general interpretation. At the head of the list, where am I going to be fishing? What type of lake will I be fishing? Then I know what my keys are, as long as I get through this study area. So I'm going to be dealing with that next time we get together and I appreciate you being here today. Hope you learned a little something. Like us on Facebook if you would, follow us on Instagram, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't done it. We appreciate you. We appreciate each and every one, and we'll see you the next time.